Let me give you some data. We're going to look at the scientific and practical facts. I'm an MD. I practice in Houston, Texas. I specialize in clinical immunotoxicology, how toxins affect the human body, and in particular, how toxins affect the immune system. So a lot of patients I see have been affected by chemicals or vaccines or contaminated indoor environments. We see patients who have seen 20, 30, 40 doctors. Our record is 36 doctors in 18 months. They come in with a shopping bag full of prescription medication they've tried or that they're taken half of these medications or they'll bring in a shopping bag full of blue-green algae and, and uh, shark cartilage enemas and, and um, uh, you name it, you, you know, I've, I've seen it all. And these people are taking all these other things because they tried the pills and everything and it didn't work. So now they're trying anything else to try and make it work. So I know those people who are taking, you know, the barley green and everything else have already been through this route. So let's talk about how it was a long time ago. In the 1950s, government figures show that 75% of the air we breathed was outdoor air. Why? Because if a family had a car, it was one car. And it was dad's car to go to work with. And on Sundays, you got to ride in it. And it didn't have an air conditioning unit. You rode with the windows down. You can't find a car today without an air conditioner. It's hard. Back then, it was common. Today, 94% of the air we breathe is indoor air, 94%. We live in an air-conditioned house where the HVAC system, heating, ventilation, air conditioning system is centralized. It's no longer that thing in the window in mom and dad's bedroom. It's the whole house and we get into our air-conditioned car, which we park in the driveway as close to the door as we can, or in the garage, and drive to work or drive to the store we're going to, and we try to park as close as we can to that front door. And we'll go around the parking lot 10 times looking for that spot that's close to the front door, hoping somebody will come out and give us the first best parking spot right there by the door. And then we go in and it's two sets of doors. Why? Because it's that same air recirculating, whether it's a grocery store, a shopping center, a building, such as this one. How many sets of doors did you go through to get in here? So part of that came about in the 70s, if, for those of you who are old enough to remember, when there was an oil embargo and there were long lines to get gasoline. And we decided that we were going to become energy efficient and not depend on foreign oil. That was a joke. <laughs> <clears throat> what we did was essentially said that if you want any federal money to build a building such as this one, a library, public libraries, public schools, courthouses, etc., you had to build it energy efficient which means you have to have that same air recirculating over and over. But people put new carpeting in buildings every so often, and they paint the walls, or they put, uh, I don't know, they, they shine the floors, they squirt for bugs, etc. The other thing that happens in buildings is they sometimes leak, or structures, I should say. So what happens when you have something where there's a water intrusion. Water intrusion is kind of the catchword, if you wish, 
in this field. You have water come in and it pools somewhere. Uh, it could be from around a window and you may not see it. It could be a roof leak. Mold spores start to revive. And when they revive, they multiply. And when they multiply, they release spores. And those spores carry on them mycotoxins. And mycotoxins affect us. And there's also bacteria that starts growing. Gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria that release endotoxins. And then you get this mixture, say it's between the wall somewhere, and it grows through drywall, and once it gets through that drywall, say it's in a home or in a nice office and you've got wallpaper, well, first it goes through that drywall, then it hits glue. Okay, the glue or paint. And it combines with that chemically. And it produces what are called VOCs, volatile organic compounds. And these organic compounds are in and of themselves toxic. So, you have bacteria and molds, endotoxins and mycotoxins, and VOCs. And you're breathing this 93% of the time, 94% of the time, because it's indoor air. Now, can it have an effect on you? You bet. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, why now? Why has this problem cropped up now? Well, I have two answers for you. Three. First, we didn't use drywall like we do today. We used plaster. Remember that? And nothing grows on plaster. It's very alkaline. So it wasn't such a problem. Secondly, it's been known since, what is it, 1200 BC? Moses took 40 years to do a 10-day trip as he wandered through the desert. Leviticus chapter 14. If there's a growth on the wall of a home, have the rabbi come by and mark that line where it stops growing and have all the inhabitants leave and the rabbi comes back one week later and if that growth has passed the line that the rabbi marked, that house and everything in it has to be destroyed. Leviticus. Now, where was Moses when he wrote this? In the desert. He wasn't in some swamp. He was in the desert. There's not a lot of water. Remember he had to hit the rock? Get water? Did they, do anybody, anybody read the Bible anymore? Oh, okay. Do you know what I'm talking about, Moses? Okay. <clears throat> You're probably wondering how many animals he put on the ark. <laughs> All right. The third thing is, when I wanted to look up something 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, when I was growing up, whatever, I had to go to the library, but only when it was open. And I had to open one of those little drawers. Remember the little drawers you open? You had these little file cards that you had to go through and go through all this rigmarole. Now, I can get to anything I want sitting in my pajamas with a cup of coffee at 2 a.m. in the morning and Google it. And people are doing that. So the information is much more available than it was. Lastly, I'm going to show you that this information that I'm talking to you about, molds, mycotoxins, etc., has been around in medicine and science for 20, 30 years. I'm going to show it to you. It's not something new. It is not unknown factor. These are medical, peer-reviewed medical journals from 
all areas of medicine. So, are you still with me? All right. <clears throat> There's about well over 100,000 species of mold. Mold grows everywhere and grows on anything. It'll grow on concrete. It'll grow on anything dry or wet. They're having a problem with it in the Middle East because it grows on jet fuel. So the other thing is when they start to grow, they multiply very fast. Think of this. Think your bedroom. I'm, I'm assuming everybody's got a bedroom that's here. Okay, and you break open a, a, a bag of bird seed. You're gonna, you have a bird feeder and you're gonna put some bird seeds to attract the nice pretty birds and it broke in your bedroom and there's seeds all over the floor. And unfortunately, you've gotta leave right then and go visit some relatives three hours away for the weekend. You promised you'd be there. And these seeds sit there. Nothing's going to happen to them, right? Correct. Now, assume while you're gone that something in your bathroom leaks and it comes in there and that water sits there for two, three days with those seeds. Well, when you come back two, three days later, you're going to have little sprouts. That's the same way with mold spores. They sit and do nothing until you get them wet. Then they sprout, so to speak. They don't sprout, they sporulate. But. So when they sprout, they multiply very rapidly and release spores. So let me take you on a little bit of a journey here. Uh, I'd say two dozen are the ones we're mainly worried about. These, these two dozen are readily recognizable. They wear t-shirts with the arms rolled up. They've got tattoos on their neck. They've got rings in their nose and in their eyebrows and all kinds of mean, nasty places that you and I would not think of putting a ring. But they're all bad. Now, I get a lot of questions, well, isn't black mold dangerous? Folks, mold comes in every color you can think of. And there are, none of them are good. Do you ask, you know, a color on a cancer? Well, what color is this cancer? Because I know if it's this color, it's bad. No, they're all bad. No one wants cancer. Same way with molds. They have all kinds of colors. They're used in biological warfare. We used it in Southeast Asia, Vietnam conflict, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam. Um, we flew 400 sorties, and it, is, and it was called Yellow Rain, and it is estimated by the military that it caused 10,000 dead. And uh, you can get on the National Guard website and look up trichothecine, which is a mycotoxin, and they will tell you how to protect your troops from it, or how to tell if your troops have been affected by it, etc. Saddam Hussein used it against the Iranians and the Kurds in the 1980s, and in the first Gulf War, sent a couple of Scud missiles over to Israel with some of these in the, the warhead. So um, it's been used in biological warfare. Um, Here's the 24 to 48 hours that we talked about. So, as I've explained to you, it's kind of like this. Molds in and of themselves, if all you're, look, all you're getting are the spores, yes, you'll get a little bit of asthma, maybe, some sort of allergy type reaction. Mycotoxins are like a bullet with molds as the gun, okay? Because mycotoxins are much worse. 
Do you remember the old Superman movies? I've always wondered about this. Superman would stand there with his hands on his hips and somebody would shoot him, some bad guy would shoot him in the chest and the bullets would bounce off and the bad guy would run out of bullets and then he'd throw the gun at Superman and he'd duck. <laughs> Why would he duck? All right, some of the names. Trichothecenes is very famous. Uh, Beta-glucans, T2 toxins, aflatoxin. Let's talk a minute about aflatoxin, which is a, comes from, mostly from aspergillus. And by the way, folks, one mold does not equal one mycotoxin. Uh-uh. One mold can produce and does a whole series of mycotoxins. The most toxic substance known to humankind is aflatoxin B2. Okay? So, the most, did you get that? The most toxic substance we know of, worse than nerve gas, worse than whatever you want, the worst of them all, the big mama, or whoever you want to call it. The, the, the baddest of the bad is aflatoxin, because it kills. Okay, and this is not my invention. The government comes out with this, a list every year of things that they consider toxic or carcinogenic or potentially carcinogenic or perhaps carcinogenic. And this is number one, numero uno. All right, that's aflatoxin, the last one on the list here. What does it cause in humans? So you're living in this house, or you're going to work, and unbeknownst to you, there's a leak somewhere, and it's pooled some water, and it could be the size of the palm of my hand, and spores, mycotoxins, etc. And then what happens? is these then start spreading. Um, in my lectures that I've given throughout the country and in other countries, I've talked to people who went back into a building after it was shut because of indoor contaminated environment, molds, and say it was a bank building and then it got under litigation and so forth, then finally they decided to go in and clean it up a year or two or three later. And they go in the building. Well, you think if a building's been shut, there's going to be all kinds of critters. You know, ants and spiders and, and cockroaches and, you know, who knows? All kinds of things flying around, floating around, flies, who knows? There ain't nothing. Everything in there is dead. They find all kinds of dead animals in the building. There's not a single cobweb, nothing. That's how mycotoxins work. So what does it do to humans? When we humans, okay, we, let me back up. Everyone has an immune system. Everyone's immune system is unique and different, like a fingerprint. And everyone's immune system has, if you want to boil it down, one job. And that job is to tell self from non-self what is normally of the body and what is foreign to the body. And its job is to tell what's good and what's bad. So, what the immune system does is protects us. It's, it's our barrier against a zillion viruses and bacteria and parasites and all kinds of stuff. The first things that mycotoxins like to do is damage seriously and severely the immune system. Why? Because if they've knocked the walls down, then they can get in. 
you know, it's like the old forts or whatever. Once the walls got breached, everybody could do whatever they wanted to. So that's what our immune system is there for. And that's the first thing that mycotoxins affect. And one of the ways they affect that is that they're very, very potent protein synthesis inhibitors. I know that sounds scientific, and it is. But it's just to t kind of tell you what it does. It suppresses the immune system. So when you have a suppressed immune system, what does that mean to you? People. Well, it means you're more susceptible to diseases, you get sicker more often, you catch everything, it takes you a lot longer to get over it, you're the first one on the block to get the flu and the last one to get over it. A cut a or a scratch takes a way too long time to heal. Your immune system isn't functioning, it's suppressed. Then what happens is when this continues for a while, the immune system is fighting it off, fighting it off, fighting it off, fighting it off, and then it, it kind of goes haywire, what we call an immune dysregulation. It goes haywire. Some parts of the immune system underreact, some others overreact, and the underreaction is, again, the getting sick and things taking a long time to heal and catching everything. The second one is you become overly sensitive. Things that you used to be able to wear, like ladies, if there was a certain perfume they wore, now they can't wear it. Uh, you can't go down certain aisles at the grocery store because that odor, oh, it just makes you... Uh, you can't go by Dillard's perfume section on your way into the store because it makes you ill. If you used to have a beer or a glass of wine or a margarita or whatever, now you can't anymore. It affects you. That's the overly sensitive, overly reacting. Thirdly, you start developing an autoimmune reaction. What's an autoimmune reaction versus an autoimmune disease? Huge difference. Huge difference. What that is is where your own immune system starts fighting everything, including yourself. You're building antibodies to yourself. You're fighting yourself. Well, the problem with that is that you go to a doctor and he runs the autoimmune test. What are autoimmune diseases? Lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, etc. And lo and behold, two or three of them are light up. So then, as a lot of doctors will do, they'll put you on steroids. What's a steroid? It's an immune suppressant. So your suppressed immune system gets really suppressed now. But interestingly, if you get off these steroids, the same symptoms are still there. So it's not really treating anything, it's just sweeping it under the carpet, so to speak. It's always there. It's just suppressed until you quit taking the steroids. And steroids can cause diabetes, cataracts, osteoporosis, a whole host of diseases. There are some, for instance, there's a heart pill that's well known to cause lupus in about 20% of the people who take it. Now, do you treat the lupus or do you take that heart pill away and, and swap it out for a different one? Well, you just swap it out for a different one. That's all. Simple. You don't assume that it's an autoimmune disease. You've got to find out what caused the problem first. Tell you a story of a patient. This guy was an, he was in the marine industry, well, you know, boats. And he used to weld and paint underwater. Okay? 
So he did all this stuff and was around all those fumes, chemicals, etc. for like 20 years. Then he came to Texas with his wife and bought an old rundown motel on a lake. It was old and rundown because the lake was the site of a munitions plant before and during World War II and it was prohibited to swim in that lake until the early 1950s because it was so thick with chemicals and there were no fish in it. And humans were not allowed to swim in it because it was so polluted. Or not polluted, because we think of pollution as one thing, but it was so toxically, uh, the levels of chemicals were way too high. Well, uh, somebody then built a motel and didn't re do anything to it until this guy came along, and he decided to redo the whole motel by himself. Well, there was all kinds of leak, not, this was one of those old-timey motels where it's a little room, you remember them, and he refurbished it, and then he dredged the front of the lake. I forget how many hundred feet he did, hundreds of feet, by himself. And what is stirring up all that stuff that's down at the bottom, okay? And then he developed something strange, and forgive me if you've already eaten, it's just your tough luck. He had explosive diarrhea. He could not eat a bite without immediately having ex explosive diarrhea. Not only that, but he had stomach cramps and pains that were so severe that his doctors put him on what we call class two drugs, which are the most, um, the strongest drugs we have, and they have a strong potential for developing a habit of taking that. We're talking about, you know, the, the, uh, the, the almost heroin drugs to kill the pain. And he was taking a slew of these. Plus, he smoked two packs a day, drank, okay, and all this. He went to see doctor after doctor, gastroenterologist. He was scoped every which way several times, this way and that way, all in a period of six months. And then they sent him to a major university medical center where he saw some big head honcho gastroenterology specialist who said, I don't know what else to add, I would continue doing the same thing. So Christmas time comes along and it's so bad and he's so desperate because he can't do anything that a surgeon, three days after Christmas Eve, opens him up and sews him back up because he couldn't find anything. Comes to see me because some folks driving back to Ohio, no, not Ohio, where's Branson? Missouri, Missouri. They're driving back to Branson, their patients, and they stop off to have a bite to eat at the little cafe at this motel. And they hear this guy's plight and they tell him, go see Campbell. So they, he comes to me. First thing I did is, told him to quit smoking. And I told him not to drink anything. He was drinking a six pack or two a day. Forgive me, but that beer has formaldehyde in it. Not anti-beer, I drink beer. So don't get me wrong. But you can't have those things and alcohol in you when you're this sick. So he quit. Not a single one of the 12 doctors he saw ever asked him what he did for a living. Not a single one. And after 12 doctors, none of them said, quit smoking. All right, that's kind of strange. But this is what we see nowadays. Oh, you have stomach pains, how long you had them? Six months, wow, what have you taken for? Oh, I see the list, okay, uh-huh. Well, have you tried this? Oh, you have, okay, have you tried that? Yeah, I have that. Have you tried this other, it's a new drug? No, I haven't. Well, take a prescription of that and let's see how you do. 10 minutes and it's done. Well. I'm not going to get into the rest of it because he'd been exposed to all kinds of things. 
and he lit up like a Christmas tree once he was tested. Okay, so when your immune system is affected, what's the first thing you feel? Fatigue. An overwhelming tiredness. You win the lottery, you're too tired to go pick up your money. And if you send your mama to get the money for you, and she says, let's go to Hawaii, you say, let's wait till next week. I'm too tired this week. Maybe I'll feel better next week. And you start reasoning with yourself. You know, I haven't been eating right. I've been worrying about the kids. I need a vacation. I haven't had a vacation in a long time. I'm getting older. Maybe it's my thyroid. Maybe I have hypoglycemia. Maybe I have that fibromyalgia. Maybe I have that chronic fatigue syndrome, and about 80% of our pa patients come in having at one time or another been diagnosed by some physician as having chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, or hypoglycemia. And they leave with none of those diagnoses. But you're too tired. You're too fatigued. You don't want to do anything. The things that used to bring you great pleasure, you're too tired to do. You go to bed and sleep eight, ten hours, or six hours, or however long you're normal sleeping, and you wake up just as tired as when you went to bed. It's an overwhelming fatigue. It's not laziness. It's not tiredness. Tiredness is when you mow the lawn in August, in the middle of the day. You come in, you're tired. Uh -uh. Oh, or you went and won the lottery and went shopping for a week in Atlanta. You're tired. But we're talking about fatigue. So that's one of the first symptoms that we have. And these are the areas that molds and mycotoxins, VOCs, affect. It's almost as if it's a pattern, a waterfall effect. Starts with the immune system, goes to the nervous system, respiratory system, and skin. And let me tell you about the nervous system. I don't mean you get nervous, but you do get somewhat depressed. Well, I'm going to get depressed if I don't have any joy in life. And it's been going on for months and months and months, and maybe a year or two year or three year, and I'm going to see doctor after doctor after doctor who end up telling you it's in your head. And I'm having no fun in life. I don't have any more pleasures. Well, if you're not depressed, there's something wrong with you. So it affects the nervous system, but it also causes a demyelinating type of disorder. These are studies have shown this. And so it gives you MS-like symptoms. And those are, you have numbness, tingling, muscle weakness, you have strange new headaches. You didn't have to, you didn't have headaches like this before. You had, everybody's had a headache, but these are different. A different intensity, they're a different length. Uh, they come more, much more frequently. They're much more severe. So they affect the nervous system. Memory loss is a common you can't remember anything. These folks live with sticky notes everywhere. They might have a discussion with their boss in the morning and not remember having, having talked to the boss in the afternoon. So it's not a light, it's not like, where'd I put my keys? We all do that. This is a significant short-term memory loss. Um, I can tell you that a lot of people also have confusion. They get lost easily going to the same place. The phone number of somebody they've called a thousand times before, all of a sudden now they can't remember that number. They get lost in words. They stop in the middle of a sentence because they can't find the right word. To, that they, they know what they want to say, they just can't get it out. It's called aphasia. So these are some of the things, and I'm, we're going to show you some photographs too as we go along. Now, here are some of the molds. 
and the mycotoxins produced by some of these. We talked about aspergillus and fusarium. Um, anybody here wearing uh, contacts? Okay, you remember the contact thing where everybody was getting infections? They couldn't figure it out. Well, it turns out that a study, and I'll show it to you, it was fusarium. It was a mold. It wasn't a bacteria. It was a mold in the liquid that you're supposed to clean it in. So here's your friend fusarium. And these two, this one is a mycotoxin that's highly estrogenic. It mimics estrogen. There's a elementary school in the state of Oklahoma in a little town and there's not a lot of kids or teachers, because it's a little town. There's five female elementary school teachers in this, and two male. And out of the five females, four of them had hysterectomies within two years. The other thing is, the kids got sick. And one of the kids, a six-year-old little girl, was brought to me and several of the other children. And this little girl, had brothers and sisters, older and younger, but she was fully developed in her pubic area like an adult female, hair and everything. And she had already had two menstrual periods, six. Okay? Penicillium is a tremorgenic mycotoxin which means it causes tremors. So I had a doctor come see me. I, by the way, I treat an enormous amount of physicians and dentists and nurses and things like that. Well, this doctor is a interventional radiologist. Does anyone know what that is? Raise your hand if not. We have a doctor that might, somebody that does know. Okay. Okay. Well, an, S, an interventional radiologist is a specialist in radiology who inserts needles into like a, a certain spot, say in the liver, to inject uh, some sort of medicine into that little spot or does all these really fine things. And he comes to see me and he says, I can't do my job. And I said, why? It's because my hands shake. Can't stick those little needles in people. There's real long needles. Well, we looked at why. He was sent to me by another doctor who is a surgeon who's been to see me in the same city, um, not Houston. So he comes to see me and we discuss it. Well, make a long story short, I'm gonna give you the Reader's Digest version. He, typically of radiologists, they'll sit in a room and have all their films and then stick them up on the these white things to look at them and dictate. And he was doing his daily dictations at this hospital. He was part of a large group, and his responsible, he was responsible for two or three hospitals, but mainly this one. And he was dictating, and somebody knocks it at the door there and says, can I come in? I'm going through this little half door behind you, because this little half door behind you is where we have some of the equipment, and I am here to check it make sure everything's fu functioning. It's the annual technician checkup, whatever you want to call it. So he uh, goes back there and comes right back out, and he says, I don't know what's happened, but there's been a big leak in there, and there's stuff growing all over the floor and walls behind there. Well, it turned out to be penicillium mold, and penicillium mold is tremorgenic, so he made arrangements not to be there anymore, and the hospital cleaned it up, and I treated him, and He's back to sticking his needles into people. Do you know the story about penicillium mold? Say no, so I can tell my story. No. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> William Fleming in Scotland put two petri dishes, you know these little flat dishes, and left them uncovered for a weekend. One had penicillium mold, and the other had a bacteria. When he came back on Monday, he realized he had left them uncovered 
But he noticed that the penicillium mold was fine, but the bacteria had stopped growing and was dead. So he said something from this penicillium mold affected this bacteria and killed it. And it, sure enough, it did. And he developed what is known as penicillin. And a lot of our antibiotics today that we've used for the past 50 years are derived from mycotoxins. When someone goes to the hospital for a bone marrow transplant, you give him a medication that suppresses the immune system so he doesn't reject it. That medication is a derivative of a mycotoxin. Okay? So, um, have you ever pulled out from your refrigerator, you know, that plastic, that bread in the plastic, you know, it's the heel, and it's been left in there for longer than you'd like to remember, and you look at it, and it's got green fuzzies and black spots and yellow things and whatnot. Those are bacteria and molds feeding on that slice of bread. Molds release mycotoxins to kill off the bacteria so it gets to have the slice of bread for itself and doesn't have to share it. That is the principle behind mycotoxins, why they're produced. They're survival of the fittest kind of thing. Now, stachybotrys and trichothecene. You're going to hear a little more about trichothecene in about half a minute. But stachybotrys was shown by Dr. Strauss of Texas Tech University last year in March at a conference held that, that I sponsored in, in, in the Houston area. He did a study on stachybotrys, and the thing that people have said all the time, well, you can't measure mycotoxins, number one. Second, mycotoxins aren't produced right away. And his study showed, A, it produces trichothecenes immediately, and second, he has a measure of, he has a method for measuring the trichothecene in the room. And he did a very beautiful study on that. Okay, how bad are they? Well, they're known to cause kidney cancer, esophageal cancer, leukemia, uh, cancer of the liver with a 10-year latency period, testicular cancer, and also prostate cancer, but only in men. I want to make sure you're still awake. Okay. Is that too hard for you to read? Can you all read that? Yes or no? Okay, thank you. That's pretty simple. Straightforward, pretty plain. Journal of Family Practice, look at the year. 20 years ago. British Medical Journal, 20 years ago. American Journal of Respiratory Disease, 1989. All saying this. Is this new? Has it been in various journals? Has it been around for at least 20 years? Yes. British Medical Journal. All in that same general five-year period. Okay, let's look at this. Spores of toxigenic fungi contain mycotoxins. Mycotoxins are going to be absorbed by respiratory epithelium and translocated to other sites, producing systemic effects. What systemic effects means in medicine is in other organs, in other tissues. Look at the years. I mean, these are all peer-reviewed and respected journals. But this is 20 years ago. And you go to a doctor today, and he still hasn't figured it out. Look at stachybotrys. Produce a range of highly toxic macrolytic trichothecenes 20 years ago. 
The effects of these toxins range from extreme irritation and necrosis of skin. I'm going to show you necrosis of skin in a minute. That means death of skin. And mucous membranes to hemorrhage, exhaustion of bone marrow, and immunosuppression, which we've talked about. I know Bill Croft. He's a nice guy. Do you know what happened to him two years ago? Federal government came by knocking on his door because somebody complained about what he's doing. A particular group that we all give money to every month if we drive a car, if we have a home, if we have, we work. You know what I'm talking about? Do I have to say it? Hello? Very good. You're starting to learn. I like that. And uh, cost him a, a small fortune to prove that my lab is fine. And he's been doing this for how long? But they don't like it that they're proving. They want to prove that everything about this is just hogwash. That you can put molds on a slice of bread and have it for breakfast. Okay. This is the trichothecene again. Potent toxicity in man. Now, you have to forgive this study because it's 27 years ago, and back then we used to say man. Now we'd say men and women or humans. So it's politically incorrect. But we'll forgive Dr. Jarvis, who teaches at Tennessee still, and that was 83, and this is uh, Dr. Yuno in 1980, and includes the brain, the immune system, heart, lungs, intestines, liver, kidney, and skin. And the reason I'm showing you actual studies and quotes from studies is because I was told, I was told by Ms. Harris that doctors have told her these things can't cause that. Baloney. We've known that for almost 30 years. Now, we have the CDC just down I-20, a few hours from here. If you look up mold in their little search box, it'll tell you that molds, well, you know, they can cause some problems. They can give you some allergies, and some respiratory irritation, and you sh shouldn't really mess with it, you know, but, and there's a lot of controversy about it, but we're not sure. Now, trichothecene comes from mold. It doesn't come from anything else. It's a direct mycotoxin. So you look up the word trichothecene in the search box, and this is what you get. Trichothecene mycotoxins may be weaponized, okay? Dermal exposure leads to burning pain, oral exposure, vomiting and diarrhea, ocular exposure, blurred vision, inhalation, nasal irritation and cough. And systemic symptoms can develop with all routes of exposure, meaning whether you inhaled it, it got on your skin, or you swallowed it, you're going to include Weakness, ataxia, low blood pressure, coagulation defects, meaning you bleed, and death. I think that's pretty final. It can kill you. All right? So, blah, blah, blah. And they go on to tell you how terrible these things are, et cetera. Cool. And they go on and they say additional resources. There's only four. That's me. Here's Dr. Vajdani. Here's Thrasher. Um, how can they say on one part of their website that it's just a little problem and the next, on, on the same, the same people are saying it causes death. It can cause death. All right. But that's the federal government for you. My worst nightmare is I am awakened and told, and I, if somebody's knocking on my door and I open the door, 
and there's somebody standing there saying, hi, I'm from the federal government, and I'm here to help you. God bless. This is environmental health perspectives. This is a journal that's published by the National Institutes of Health, NIH, monthly. When you subscribe, you get a big envelope that says, U yellow envelope that says US government, printing office. So what I wanted to show you is this date, August, and by the way, you can read it, because after a certain time, you don't have to, it's available to the whole public, because this is a publicly funded, government, federal government funded organization. But keywords, satrotoxin, stachybotrys, trichothecene, et cetera, okay? Well, conclusion, they're talking about how this can cause, in this study, this is just the, an objective, a, a little paragraph they put in the beginning. Now let's look at the month before. This is satrotoxin G from the black mold stachybotrys, okay? You don't have to read all this, but look at this. These findings suggest that neurotoxicity, which means brain, spinal cord, and nerves, and inflammation within the nose and brain, brain, are potential adverse health effects of exposure to satrotoxin and stachybotrys in the indoor air of water-damaged buildings. Why does the CDC says it just irritates the respiratory system? But the National Institutes of Health says this. Online, February 06, published July 06. The other one was August. JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association. Same thing, August. Remember we talked about contact lenses? A new culprit, okay? Conclusion, this is what they call a, um, an abstract. So they don't publish the whole thing, they're publishing just a little piece, and then if you want to, you can read the whole thing. And you can get this out of this journal, okay? The most common antimicrobial medication that is administered prior to fusarium diagnosis so these people were all treated with antibiotic drops. But it's a mold, not a bacteria. So you can have all the antibiotic drops you want in the whole world. It ain't gonna do nothing. Excuse my English, double negative, all that. All right, so they're telling you that it causes keratitis of the eye with a bunch of patients come to see us. I'm not an ophthalmologist, but they come, blurred vision, wearing really dark glasses, one eye swollen shut, etc., and their doctor keeps giving them steroid drops with antibiotic drops. That's like ordering a pregnancy test on all the males in this room. Okay. Again, I'm stressing how this is not new. This is 1992, Dr. Miller, atmospheric environment. Mixture of compounds produced by molds have considerable toxicological significance. And remember I mentioned VOCs? Over 500 VOCs have been described from fungi. The dominant VOC is ethanol. Where is she? She leave? I don't see her, but I was talking to a lady earlier. Itself is a potent synergizer of many toxins. What is, you know what it means by synergizer? When you put them together, it's like, whoa, really big. Okay, 1992. Okay, uh, follow me through these next three slides. I'm, I'm just going to point out some things and then show you. 40 investigations from many different countries demonstrate an association between living in damp homes or homes with mold growth and adverse respiratory symptoms in children. What are the symptoms? Fatigue, headache, 
symptoms from the central nervous system. The problem is there's a lot of schools with this problem of mold. And what happens, a child's immune system develops from birth to adolescence and requires a natural stimulation. Okay? And any disturbance of this normal maturing process may increase the risk for abnormal reactions. And school officials are like ostriches. They put their head in the sand. And every once in a while they look out, they pull their head out of the sand to make sure everything's calm, and if it's not, they put their head back in the sand. I have a feeling they don't really put their head in the sand because here in Georgia and other states it's clay, so they put it in another orifice. <laughs> a handier one for them and larger. Okay, symptoms reported, blah, blah, blah. Look at this. Nosebleed and hemoptysis, coughing up blood, okay? That's not irritation. When a kid coughs up blood, is that irritation? Excuse me, if any one of my four kids would have coughed up blood, whoa, that is not a good sign, okay? Okay, now here's this underlying sentence that I want you to pay attention to. This inflammation, and they mean of the respiratory tree, can be induced by the well-recognized allergic IgE-mediated mechanism, but also by non-allergic mechanism induced by toxic agents. And the allergist refused to see this other, but also from here, they, they, they quit here. Everything is an allergy, okay? It's kind of like if, like a hammer. Pretty soon everything looks like a nail. Last one on this three series. Identification is important because some are known to produce potent mycotoxins. So, extensive mold growth, especially toxigenic mold growth, also requires that the remedial workers be protected. And when I'm done, another gentleman is going to show you a little bit of that. But look at who did this. Ruth Etzel and Rylander. Rylander is from um, Sweden. Ruth Etzel works for the government here and NIH. And at that time she was working in the, what is it, the North Carolina Triangle thing? You all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Tri-Cities area, North Carolina, you know, and all that. Guess where she was transferred to after this article? Alaska. It was inconvenient truth. Okay. Now, this is an, a last study, and I'm not going to bore you with these anymore. This is guidelines, okay? And contractors and other professionals who respond to mold and moisture in commercial buildings and schools may want to follow these guidelines. Look at this, roof leaks, landscaping or gutters, uh, combustion appliances, delayed maintenance, insufficient maintenance, okay, problems in schools and large buildings, portable classrooms, temporary structures, all these have issues. Then, they tell you what, and this is the United States EPA, and this was in the year 2000, seven years ago. So anyone who says there are no government guidelines, you can tell them to go suck a large egg, ostrich preferably. Do not touch it, or anything that looks like it with your bare hands. Do not get mold or mold spores in your eyes, do not breathe these things, consult personal protective equipment and containment guidelines. What they're saying here is wear, you know, the, the whole suits and everything else before you touch it or inhale it. Don't get near it. And lastly, 
minimum is an N95 respirator, gloves, and eye protection. And how many of you saw pictures of volunteer groups going to New Orleans with nothing but flip-flops, shorts, t-shirt, and sometimes one of those little flimsy paper masks? Now, in 2006, senior advisor to the EPA was at a conference in Minneapolis and was interviewed by the editor of the Minneapolis newspaper. And they were talking about Katrina and New Orleans and everything that had happened in Rita as well, et cetera. What this gentleman, the senior advisor, told the editor, and this is public knowledge, it's pub it was printed in their paper and you can look it up, he was saying that the United States government removed, the, the federal government removed the normal OSHA requirements for the cleanup of New Orleans because it would cost too much doing it the right way. And they had to divert some of that money to a war somewhere else and in Iraq. So they, they wanted, they didn't want to spend quite that much money in taking care of New Orleans. The other thing they said, he said, the editor asked him, well, what about all our church groups and you know, college volunteers during spring break and all these people who go down there and they're, they're around this stuff all the time. This senior advisor said, expect a lot of cancers in 10 to 15 years. United States Environmental Protection Agency, 2002. Here's the Academy of Pediatrics. Stachybotrys, Aspergillus, Penicillium, etc. They're reporting a case of an infant with pulmonary hemorrhage. That means bleeding in the lungs, okay? So they found this in the house of this kid, and this material proved to be highly toxigenic, stachybotrys, the link between stachybotrys in the home and pulmonary hemorrhage in, inf in infants increases. Well, that came out of a study by these folks, environmental health perspectives. Look at the year. 1999, and I know Jay Portnoy, he's an allergist and pediatrician in Kansas City. He's a professor. The point is, it causes infants who experience pulmonary hemorrhaging and hemosiderosis were 16 times more likely than controls to have lived in homes with water damage, according to who? Ruth Etzel, who was banished to Alaska. Here is, do indoor pollutants and thermal conditions in schools influence students' performance? This is the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. They said, yeah, it does. So kids not having good grades and stuff like that, and ADD-ish, and all that kind of stuff, autism? This is the government of Canada, Canadian Human Rights Commission that came out this summer, okay? And it talks to you about the mold and all that it causes, et cetera. And what it's increasingly recognized as serious contaminants, okay, cause neurological and psychological disorders, including depression, okay? Um, inflammatory responses, asthma, allergies, and environmental sensitivities, damage to the nervous system, and peripheral neuropathy and neurophysiologic abnormalities. And you know where they got some of this data from? The studies we did at our center. This is straight out of the, the federal government, and here's Dr. Strauss. So these are, are things that other countries are paying attention to. And here's some of those symptoms that I've mentioned to you.
You can read. I don't need to read these out to you. You, can, you're, you went to school. Actually, pets can get sick too. Veterinarians know a lot about these disorders. All right, this is looking down in between walls. Okay, so you're looking down, and what do you see here? Mold. Again, this is in between. You can't see this unless you get into this area. Isn't this neat? The people went skiing for a week. The apartment upstairs, or the condominium upstairs, leaked. They came back and opened the door. See how it's come down and it's wonderful. This is on the table. This is on their clothes. These are not salvageable, by the way. See how it's on the walls? And you can tell by the date, this is not Katrina. This is insulation. And you remember how you should change those filters regularly? This is a, a patient of mine. This was her first visit, and this is a penny. I'm sorry the quality of the picture is kind of grainy, but we didn't have the necessary pig cells back then. This is the wound. Val, is that a penny or a quarter? Penny, thank you. Because the there's another one here that has... These are all over. These are on her legs, her arms, her abdomen, and her breasts. This is two years later. She only had, remember the two before next to each other? They're basically gone. This one was that big one I showed you at first. Here she was before getting sick from molds. And this is when she came to see me, two years later. This is her friend. These ladies, by the way, are Mary Kay people. And they were at the top of the heap. They were going around the country giving lectures. They had all, I mean, talking to five, 600 women at a time in big auditoriums. So they were really with it and traveling and doing whatever it took. Now look at this lady. She was being treated for all kinds of misdiagnosis and whatnot. And she wants me to put her name on all these. Because hopefully you'll sell some of her products. And this is what you should really be careful with in case you get in any kind of a flood. <laughs> any questions? When you inhale these things for several months in a building or in a home and you move away, that doesn't, it makes you maybe 10, 15 percent, 20 percent better, but the damage doesn't go away. You've got to repair what's been damaged. So unless you do that repair, this goes on and on, and you've seen the latency periods, you know, 10, 15 years is not unusual. So unless it's treated, and we see a lot of folks who said this happened to me in 1999 and 2002, et cetera. How could it be? Well, if you're exposed to a high dose of radiation today, you're going to still be feeling the effects of that high dose of radiation 10 years from now. It doesn't go away just because you've moved away. Someone comes to see me. My average office visit is four hours long, sometimes eight hours. I don't have 10, 20 minute slots or 30 minutes, they don't exist. Uh, my returning office visit, once you've been to see me after the first initial time, et cetera, is an hour to two hours. There's no way to get around this and be quick about it. Most people have multiple system disorder. It's not just one nostril that's bleeding. 
No, they're coughing, they have stomach pains, they have headaches, they don't sleep well, they're fatigued, they have this, that, and the other. And the last thing I want is to give them a bunch of pills to treat symptoms. I mean, there are a lot of times when I take that bag and I go whoosh, into that bag and say, take this home and put it away in a closet. You're not going to need it. I don't do woo-woo medicine. I'm not supposed to use that word, Valerie told me. But I don't do strange medicine. I don't have you sprinkle herbs on, on your toenail clippings or whatever. I just uh, straight medicine like everyone else. The first thing to do is, or at least this is what I do, and this has been published. I mean, it's nothing new. There's textbooks on this. I look at the person and decide what has to be done to find out in that person. Remember, you're like a fingerprint. There's no two of you alike. I'm going to find out what parts are affected, how severely, so I can fix those parts, I can repair them. I know this sounds like a car mechanic, but it's, it's easy to understand this way. I want to be able to repair what's damaged. Okay, now how do you do that? First, you do some tests, depending on what your symptoms are and what you have uh, wrong with you. I mean, that's common. If the patient brings their medical records, I review them with the patient. Why? Because sometimes I'll read that they took a biopsy of the left breast and they said, no, the scar's on the right one. Little things, but they're significant. So I go through the medical records. Any tests that have already been done, that's great. I don't need to do them then. Most of the tests I do are sent to very specific labs. Why? Say you use a good company called Quest that a lot of HMOs, PPOs, and all those they contract with. Well, that they come pick up the blood from your doctor's office in the afternoon, at the end of the day. They hang one of those white boxes or on the door, they come pick up the blood. The courier takes it to their central office in the city. Then it's shipped overnight to their central whatever distribution spot. For me, it's Dallas. They send it to Dallas. Dallas looks at it and it says, oh, this test we're going to send to this lab here. This other test we're going to send to that lab there. Okay? And they do that the next day. Then the blood gets there the third day at that lab. Well, that means your lymphocytes and cells are now 48 hours old. To me, that's worthless. I'm very, very particular about what lab I use, and I've been to them. I've looked at them. I want to know who is running the lab. I want to know how clean it is. I want a lab that I can eat spaghetti off the floor. I want to see a lab that's clean, well run, and there's somebody overseeing the whole operation continually and available not four technicians stuck somewhere and they clock out at the end of the day. I'm not interested in that lab. So I'm very specific, and because I am specific, I know every lab director of the labs that I use. And I will sometimes pick and choose what lab I want. I'm not gonna send, oh, do this. No, I'm gonna find out what their methodology is, because there are methods, and I want the method that's the most precise. There's a lab in uh, Utah, it's a well-known lab, but they use a very old method. I'm not interested in that, why? Because it's not that accurate. It's okay, but it's not accurate. I want something as precise as I can get it. And so I deal, that's how I deal with labs. I also, I then usually, once I gather all the data, and we spend a lot of time together, then, once I get the data in, which may be a week or two or three later, depending on what was needed, et cetera, and, you know, a lot of these tests, my patients will take to their hometown. I mean, we see patients from everywhere. Uh, 
Hong Kong to Abu Dhabi, and every state in the Union, including Alaska and Hawaii. So, you know, they might want to do an MRI or, or whatever. I don't know. Maybe they don't need an MRI. I'm just throwing that out. They might want to do that in their local community, wherever. And then I get the results back, and I review them. And then we start a plan. Now, most of the time, it's a balance, because there's some people who are actually taking medicine that if I took them right off of it, they'd get sick. So I have to taper down. Okay, and then I have to add ant an antifungal, say, or a this or a that, depending on what it is. These are prescription drugs. They're available at any CVS or Walgreens in the United States. It's a little more complex for the people that live in foreign countries, but even they can get it. And you get treated. And sometimes some people are pretty healthy. Others are not that healthy. Why? Because they've been smoking two, three packs a day for 30 years six pack of beer every night, and two cases on the weekends for 30 years. <laughs> you know, they're out of shape. It takes a little longer to get them back in, in a healthy mode. Also look at foods that you eat. You get to be on a nutritional plan. Why? Because that's essential. Do you eat chicken? Anybody here eat chicken? Raise your hand. Okay. Do you know that all commercial chicken feed in the United States contains arsenic? Arsenic is a heavy metal, like mercury and lead. It swells the stomach of the chicken up, the chicken eats more, and it's sold by weight. The American poultry industry can take an egg to a fryer chicken in 45 days. If I would have told my grandmama that, that there are people that make a whole chicken from an egg in 45 days, she would have slapped me on the head that the wall would have had a dent in it for lying and telling stories. So, but that's the way we do things. So when you get down to the bone, you notice it's purple, and you think it's veins. It's not veins. When you take a raw steak and cook it, does it turn purple? Does the blood turn purple? No, it turns dark brown, reddish dark brown. Well, if you take arsenic as a white powder and heat it, it turns purple, dark purple. Okay, beef. All beef in the United States, besides being sprayed and injected for parasites, etc., five days before its sacrifice, is injected with DES, diethyl estilbestrol, a female hormone. That's why we can't sell them to the Europeans. DES was a drug given to pregnant women at one time in this country 40 years ago. Babies were born with malformations. It became illegal to give humans DES, but it's okay to give a female hormone to steak. I love steak. But unless you go to one of the really expensive steak houses and pay $25 to $35 for a sirloin, you're going to get the hormone-fed stuff. Then, you want some more? <laughs> oh, you're, you're not going to know what to eat tomorrow. Eggs. Get eggs that are natural, not the fake eggs. Okay? And take a natural egg from a real chicken that walked around and scratched and did this, that you pick up and do this with and whatnot, for those of you who have those kind of fond memories, and crack it open next to a regular store-bought egg in a pan and fry them both up. They look different, they fry at different rates, and they taste vastly different. The look is enough to scare the living bejesus out of you because it's like eating two different things just by looking at it. Okay, dairy. Jersey cows in the United States are injected with a female hormone because that way they produce between 15 and 17 percent more milk. What you may not know is that these Jersey cows also have more mastitis, 
infections of the udders. Well, think about it. They're being milked more. Secondly, they die young. So we have a female hormone anytime we eat beef, whether it's hamburger or steak. And we have a female hormone when we eat cheese, yogurt, cream cheese, ice cream, butter, etc. And so when a kid goes and has a cheeseburger happy meal and a milkshake, they're getting hormones, estrogenic disruptors. And what happens? Why is it that we are now seeing girls 8, 9, and 10 develop menarche when it used to be 12, 13, and 14. You know what I'm talking about, menarche? Yes, no, maybe? That's when, you know. And why, when they're age 12, do they look like a full-blown woman? Okay? And why, when I was in training here, and I also trained in Orlando, there was maybe here, the only infertility person was one doctor at MCG. One doctor. Now we have infertility clinics all over the place. There's one on every block, any city, almost. Right? Well, we have men eating estrogen in dairy products and in beef, and now we have women developing at way too young and early age and not being able to reproduce. And it's much more the man's fault. Think of it. If you're given estrogen, how much are you going to produce? Not much as a guy. It's going to be abnormal. Second of all, we have an increasing rate of breast cancer. Why? We have better ways to detect it. There are regular screenings. But the percent of and rate is increasing. So it's not because there's more people. It's because it is increasing. And why is it that of all the men in this room, it's a question of when are we going to develop prostate cancer, not if? And then we, we are told to eat grains, whole wheat, stuff like that. Well, in 1996, the Department of Agriculture announced to Congress in its annual report that 98% of agricultural land in the United States is devoid of nutrients. There's nothing left in the ground. It's been sucked up because during World War II, there were a whole bunch of plants, munitions plants, bomb plants, etc., that when World War II was over, they became fertilizer plants and they sold a lot of fertilizer. And we subsidized farmers to not grow things. Do you remember in the 60s when we used to sell gazillion tons of grain to the Russians? Well, part of the reason for that is we had surplus. But we we're using fertilizers of all kinds and we've sucked everything out of the earth there is. And then we take all kinds of chemicals, pesticides, fungicides, pesticides, etc that we spray on fruits and vegetables. Then it rains, and this stuff goes into the ground. It's sucked up by the roots and ends up in the fruits and vegetables. The average amount in a fruit or vegetable bought at a regular grocery store is 12 chemicals per fruit or vegetable in the United States, of which 20% are known carcinogens. I've, I've never treated anyone successfully in 14 days. And I've seen probably by now about 30,000 patients. He said that I may have more treatment done. I'm really easy to get sick. I just have a little cold and go pneumonia. And yes, it will affect your teeth, and they'll literally break. Some people have their teeth break, and some people have all kinds of gingivitis, and sometimes it's the dentist that says, this isn't about your teeth, there's something else wrong with you. you all of the doctors say, no, there's nothing. Do you think that that could be affected in some other way? You bet. I don't know. 
14 days is way too short. So you think I need more treatment than antifungal medicine? Ma'am, I can't, by law, give you any medical advice like that. I will tell you, in general, that there is no treatment that I know of in molds or fungi that is only for 14 days, unless it's for toenail fungus or some something like that, but not for anything. Well, ma'am, there's actually a disease. There's a lot of farmland in this area of, of the country. If I, I don't know, if there was 30 years ago, and there's a condition known as farmer's lung. What farmer's lung is? It's aspergillosis of the lung. You get actually a fungus ball the size of a tangerine can grow in the lungs. And why? Because you, farmers will toss hay, and that hay will be moldy. And they're breathing it, and they develop farmer's lung. I had a patient who spent, who's a farmer, a rancher, in Louisiana. He raises cattle and quarter horses. He spent three weeks at the Mayo, and they could not figure out what was wrong with him. He came to see me after one test. I mean, it, I asked him, what, what do you do? You know, and how do you do it? And, and do you use this and that and the other? I mean, it was clear. Sure enough, within a, after six weeks of treatment, all of a sudden, a miracle. Not a miracle. You diagnose it right. Well, he had aspergillosis of the lung. He had pulmonary aspergillosis. And I didn't need a bronchoscopy. Is that, um, do you know about histoplasmosis? Histoplasma. Histoplasmosis is, comes from the mold called histoplasma. Histoplasma is in the ground. It's in dirt. And if Bird you, like excuse me? Bird dropping. Bird droppings, histoplasmosis, coccidiodomycosis, all those come from those places. As a matter of fact, our standard panel of tests will contain what is called pigeon droppings. Not that you're around a lot of pigeons, but people sleep on feather pillows, which contain frequently pigeon feathers. Well, you'd be amazed at how good you feel if you don't have feather pillows. Get anything but feather or down. All right, we have a question up front here. Hi, thank you for taking my question. I've been exposed to some mold and have a cough, and I just got a large adrenal gland. Yep. Could that be caused from the exposure to mold? Sure. The most common things that we see are problems with the thyroid and the adrenal directly related. Hypo or hyper? If neither, it's anybody's too. How does my doctor go about concerning whether it's directly caused by this mold exposure? Why do I have to make sure my doctor's doing the right thing? Uh, how do I tell if you're doing the right thing? How can I make sure the doctor is up on what exposure to mold? How do I treat a person just I, I don't know any other way. Now, when you... What happens, remember, with the autoimmune reaction? Not disease, reaction. You develop an autoimmune thyroiditis and you have adrenal antibodies. Very common, very common. I published a study on that 10 or 15 years ago. And I have a list of publications. And by the way, they're at the National Library of Medicine, so they're online. All you got to do is type into PubMed and, and you get these, so you can read, included our studies on, on the antibody, the immune system, autoimmune system, and all that. Now, they're scientific studies. They're not light reading. They're medical studies. Hey, doctor, thank you. Uh, my wife was sick. I checked the, underneath the house, and uh, there was a leak, and we got somebody to fix the leak, and there is some mold. Should I spray with stuff I got from Lowe's or what should I do? I, I will tell you what I would do with a patient 
but I cannot tell you what I would do with a house. But mold contamination is very common. And anything, remember what let's, Moses was pretty wise and smart. I mean, he, he and God used to sit down and talk with each other. He you know, must have been a good guy, much better than I am. And he says, anything in the house has to be destroyed along with it. We have cases, we have a case, well, patient, mom and dad, she's a gospel singer, and you may have heard her, but I'm not going to give her name away, and he's a banker, and they have five kids, all under 15, and everybody bought new mattresses. They all got new mattresses for all their beds, so it was a hefty price. And then two weeks later, they found out they had mold in their house, and they moved to an apartment. They took the mattresses. The kids continued with all the same symptoms. Okay? I didn't know that they had taken the mattresses. They told me they went to Walmart and bought everything fresh. They did not tell me about the mattresses. In questioning and questioning and spending time with Mama, finally turned out that they had taken the mattresses. I said, take the mattresses, put it out on the porch tonight. She did. The next day, the kids were fine. Well, they weren't fine. They didn't have headaches when they woke up, and there was no more blood on the pillows from nosebleeds. One last question. When people say yeast, there was a book written by Bob Crook, was his name, long time ago in 86. I know Bob. He's pretty much retired now. But at that time, he wrote the yeast connection. And um, it was ahead of its time, but it's behind the time now because it's more than 20 years old, and yeast is mold. You're talking about usually candida, but there's a lot of species of candida, and you've got to look at what species you're talking about, because candida can cause meningitis and pneumonia and can kill you. So it's not yeast only. Now, the way women know yeast is when they take an antibiotic and they get a yeast overgrowth, vaginally speaking. But in general, that's a candida species. But the other kinds can be quite bad. Yeast diets, that's all they are. They don't take, and, and there's a lot of doctors that believe in that and use Nystatin to take care of that and so on and so forth. But what you do then is you disturb the gastrointestinal lining of its normal bacteria and bacterial balance. Let me explain for you for just a moment, and then I really need to let the other speaker come. For thousands of generations before us, we ate fruit only in season, vegetable only in season. Bread was a staple. It was ground up and made. We ate meat only on certain super special occasions, okay? We ate a lot of dairy products, whether it was uh, dairy or butter or milk or yogurt, which was quite common back for thousands of generations back. And these were from anything from uh, sheep to cows to goats to yaks to camels, anything, giving milk. In the last two generations, and, and by the way, none of your ancestors ever had an antibiotic. And antibiotics kill all bacteria, good and bad. They, have, they do not discriminate. They kill them all. It's like an A-bomb. Kills the cool, good people and the bad people. So then, what happens to the natural balance of your gastrointestinal tract that begins within 24 hours of birth? when bacteria colonizes your gastrointestinal tract, and these are good bacteria that help you digest, that help produce things, etc. And we wipe them out regularly by taking antibiotics. 
okay? And then we think, well, maybe I have leaky gut syndrome or irritable bowel syndrome or I've got the yeast thing or I've got the this and the that and the other. There's going to be soon, I hope, sooner rather than later, a real, re a real realization in American medicine and the public that there's a certain benefit to substances known as probiotics. Probiotics are actually good bacteria. Now most of us, most of the public knows, knows about lactobacillus, but that's just one out of many, okay? So when you, you really need more than just one, and there's many species of that one. So all of this has to be taken into consideration, at least when I examine a patient and I find out what's wrong with them. Because they've got to get back into balance, what we call homeostasis in medicine, a balance between all the systems. And that includes the gastrointestinal system. Let me bring up one more point and then I'm, okay? In 1998, Dr. Ponikow and his group presented an article at the annual meeting of the ear, nose, and throat surgeons and published it in the Proceedings of the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Ponikow is head of ear, nose, and throat at the Mayo, okay? What he did was he wanted to find out what is the most common cause of chronic rhinosinusitis? What does that mean? Chronic, runny, stuffy nose. The crud, the cold, the yuck, the hmm <laughs> Okay? So he and his group went up with their strange instruments that they have and up into the sinuses and pulled out gunk that I don't like to look at, they love that stuff, and looked at it to find out what is the most common cause of yuck, okay? Is it virus? If so, what kind of virus? Is it a bacteria? If so, what kind of bacteria are we talking about? Well, when they did, when he did this, what do you think he found? What? Fungus. What percent do you think he found was fungus? 96.8. 213 patients, 203 was fungus, not a bacteria, not a virus. But this was in 99, and since then he's come out with several more studies reinforcing that. But guess what, if you and I go to a doctor today internist, ENT, family doctor, whatever, and we say we've got the crud, we've got the common runny, gunky nose thing, we're going to get an antibiotic and a decongestant. Yeah, and you'll feel better, it'll go away, but then a few weeks later it's back again. Now why the hell did I read that study back almost 10 years ago, and it seems to me that nobody else in the world has read that friggin' study? Well, excuse me, it doesn't take that long. It's online. It's free. As long as you're a licensed MD, the Mayo Clinic will mail it to you free. Why not read the darn thing? I mean, is this genius? I'm not genius. I'm talking common sense. Just plain old horse sense. We call it horse sense in Texas. What do y'all call it? See? So, there's a lot more to fungus, but no one wants to read it. No one wants to pay attention. The, the Canadian government, that study that came out this summer, the recommendation was taken up by the Canadian government, and they're retraining every healthcare provider in Canada. That means doctors, nurses, uh, physical therapists, dentists, every health care to become aware of what a contaminated indoor environment can do. You know, folks, I think that the Canadians and us, we're, we're pretty much alike. Why the hell can't our government do the same thing? They've already done it. Just copy it. 
They don't have to do it from scratch like they did. Amazing, isn't it? They're retraining, willing to spend the time and money to retrain all their healthcare professionals, and we bury our head in the sand. <sighs> Folks, I appreciate you listening to me and my stories. I appreciate you inviting me down here, and God bless you all. <laughs>